hey, uh, before you sit down, let me read one verse out of the Bible. That's what we're talking about today. Psalm 91 says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare of the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I am trusting him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from the fatal plague. He will shield you with his wings. He will shelter you with his feathers. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. All right, you can be seated. I don't know if you knew uh, that uh, God has wings and feathers, but he does. Uh, Just kidding. Uh, You ever been, uh, you know, it's been raining yesterday and today and... um, have anybody ever been caught out in the rain, caught out without shelter and uh, without an umbrella? Yeah. Probably the worst time that that ever happened to me was a few years ago. We were, um, first time I ever went out on the river with Jeff and uh, his brother go, had some lines that we were going to check. And so we, I went with him and I was always scared of the river anyways. And it started raining as soon as we put the boat in. And then it just like was downpouring. It was pouring so much that Um, I had a a bucket inside the boat that I was having to scoop it out and uh, lightning was coming down hitting the water and we're in a metal boat it was it was scary but we had to check the lines you know what I mean like you had to see yeah we had to get the fish Uh, there's no two ways about it and then last year we were um, Ed Holland who helped us with the uh, connect journey he came in from Texas and I took him uh, took him up fishing in Smithville and it was like a Sunday night, and uh, the fish were biting. And you could see off in the distance, the clouds were rolling in. He started getting nervous. He was like, we might want to think about getting off the water. I'm like, no, the, the fish are biting. What are you talking about? And so there's, there, they came in and started raining, and you could see lightning hitting all around us. And he's scared. He's like, you got to get me off the water. And I'm like, the fish are biting. Like, what don't you understand about that? Like, no, I should have dropped him off and went back out. But we're just, you know, we're cut from a different cloth. Anyways. Um, so if you got your Bible, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 20. Um, so we are, we've been doing this capital or this, uh, connect journey, uh, stewardship campaign and, but I want to kind of tie this in and this will make sense later, but we're going to go back to the book of Joshua. I've been going through that and we're in chapter 20 and I want to tie this in today to the connect journey, but I want to talk about the cities of refuge. If you ever read the Bible, you read about the six cities of refuge. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the seat in front of you, like underneath. And uh, you need to pull that out. Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible. And uh, we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 20. So here we go. It says, The Lord said to Joshua, Now tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed Moses. So this is important that in a minute I'll take you back to where God did that uh, earlier. Okay, so he goes, he goes, I instructed Moses to do this. Verse 3 says, anyone who kills another person accidentally or unintentionally can run to one of those cities. They will be places of refuge from relatives seeking revenge for the person killed. So you just need to understand, okay, this is important. Like in the Old Testament, in the law of Moses... Um, if you murdered somebody, the near, their, that person's nearest relative had an obligation to track you down and kill you. That, that's, what, that's what it was. They, they also had, you know, the, the system of justice where it was uh, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. So if you punch somebody and punch their eyeball out, they got to pull your eyeball out. If, if you punch someone and you knock the tooth out, they got to knock your tooth out. Not, not got to, like they're obligated to do that. That's, that's where you probably heard eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. That's where it comes from. They lived under that, okay? So that's what's going on here. And verse 4, it says, Upon reaching one of these cities, one of the, uh, the one who caused the death will appear before the elders at the city gate and present his case. They must, uh, right? I'm going to just go because I feel like there's some confusion. So if, if you kill somebody, if it's murder, God says you're to be put to death. And the person's nearest living relative is to track you down and put you to death. But if it's unintentional, right, because that happens, it's like we were out in the field and, and I was 
cutting with an axe and it flew off and hit you in the head and killed you or whatever, just an accident, um, then, then you had a place to flee, okay? So you weren't to be put to death because of an accident. So here's what it says. It says, they must allow him to enter the city and give him a place to live among them. Verse 5, if the relatives of the victim come to avenge the killing, the leaders must not release the slayer to them, for he killed the other person unintentionally and without previous hostility. But the slayer must, not stay, uh, must stay in the city and be tried by the local assembly, which will render a judgment as he must and he must continue to live in that city until the death of the high priest who was in office at the time of the accident. Um, after that, he is free to return to his own town, uh, own home in the town which he fled. So in this story, it's where you got avengers and you got slayers and you got a victim. So like if, if somebody gets killed, right, if it's an accident, you got that person's the person responsible is called the slayer. That's what the Bible calls them. So you got the victim, you got the slayer, and then you got the avenger, right? Um, and so I know the, you got the avengers and all that. But, uh, but the avenger is supposed to go and exact justice for his relative. So, so if I accidentally killed you, your brother is coming to find me to kill me, right? Unless, unless it was an accident in which now there's, some, there's six cities of refuge that I can run to. And it's like, once I get to the city gate, you can't come in and the Avenger can't come in and kill me. If you do, you're guilty of murder. But if you can catch me before I get to the gate, it's almost like a game, right? It's like, if, if you can catch me before I get to the home base, um, you're allowed to kill me. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn, take your Bible and turn to Exodus 21, okay? We're just laying a groundwork here, and hopefully you don't feel like this is over your head. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to show you something from the Old Testament. And... Um, which, by the way, we don't, we, we live in a different system of government, right? We, America is a, you hear so much about this lately, you, like we're a democracy. We are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic, which is different than a democracy, okay? So anyways, but that's the justice system that we live under. So in Exodus 21, here's where God gave uh, the law on this, okay? So in Exodus, Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Verse 20, chapter 21, verse 12. This is what God says. Anyone who assaults and kills another person must be put to death. Now you might go, and there's a lot of people in our society that go, I don't like that. I'm against capital punishment. Okay, you can be against it all you want. And I'm just telling you in the Old Testament, that's how God felt about it. God, God did it that way. And I'll come back to that. Verse 13, he says, but if it was simply an accident per permitted by God, I... He says, Moses goes, I will appoint a place of refuge where the slayer can run to for safety. However, if someone deliberately kills another person, then the slayer must be dragged even from the altar and be put to death. So they had this one thing in the temple, the horns of the altar, somebody could flee to that. If you couldn't make it all the way to the city of refuge, you can go to the, the altar and grab a hold of the horns of the altar and it's like, this is safe. But if you're guilty of murder, they can drag you from that. And that happened to Joab. Joab, later on, when Solomon took over for David as, after David died, Joab went and grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar. And Solomon's like, kill him there. And they went and killed him right there at the horns of the altar. So just keep that in your mind. Now I want you to go to Numbers 35. Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. Now we're in chapter 35, and we're going to look at verse 9. Just for a minute, okay? This is a long passage, but I'm not going to read all of it. So here's what it says. It says, verse 9 says, The Lord said, you know what? I, I like that. I like to hear the sound of those pages turning. I just, I'm like people bringing their Bibles. Man, it's like music to my ears. So here we go. It says in verse 9, Numbers 35, verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Give the following instruction to the people of Israel. He says, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, designate cities of refuge to which people can flee if they have killed someone accidentally. That's the key word, accidentally. Verse 12, these cities will be places of protection from a dead person's relative who want to avenge the death. And you might go, well, I thought we're not supposed to seek revenge. Yeah, that's the New Testament. That Jesus came along and was like, you guys are all into blood, 
you're bloodthirsty, you want to avenge your brother's death and all that, and I get all that, but Jesus is like, I tell you to forgive one another, right? So it's a different, Jesus was just radically different than the way they were living in the Old Testament. And uh, so he goes, uh, where did I stop? Verse 13, verse 14. He says, three, verse 13, designate six cities of refuge for yourself. Verse 14, three on the east side of the Jordan River and three on the west in the land of Canaan. These cities are for the, uh, the protection of Israelites, foreigners living among you, and traveling merchants. Anyone who accidentally kills someone may flee there for safety. Now, let's just drop down to verse 26. Where verse 24 talks about the avenger is the person who got killed. Their nearest relative is supposed to go avenge their death. Okay, So verse 26 says this. says, but if the slayer... So, the, so just assume somebody killed somebody and it was an accident. He flees to the city of refuge and he's there. He's safe. Okay, He's got to stay there until the death of the high priest... And then he can go home, but you know, who knows when that's going to be. So the, the, the avenger can't kill him while he's inside the city gates. And he says in verse 26, but if the slayer even, uh, if, but if the slayer ever leaves the, limit, the limits of the city of refuge and the avenger finds him outside the city and kills him, it will not be considered murder. The slayer should have stayed inside the city, uh, city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer may return to his own property. These are the legal requirements for you to observe for generation to generation where you may live. Now look at verse 30. All murderers must be put to death, but only if evidence is uh, presented by, two, by more than one witness. So no one may be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. That was an important thing. So now, look... Um, God established this. You, you remember what the first murder was in the Bible? Cain killed Abel, okay? Genesis chapter 4. And then, and then in Genesis 9, just write this down in the margins. Okay, Genesis 9, 6. That's where God said, the first time God said, all murderers must be put to death. If you have someone who commits murder, okay, God says those people must be put to death. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Now put this up on the screen. I just want to show you this for a second. Second, this is Israel, and these are the six cities. You got Hebron, Shechem, Kadesh, Golan, Ramoth, Gilead, and Beza. These were the, they were kind of spread out all throughout Israel. So I think I read that they're not more than 30 miles away from anybody, so you could run there for safety. Okay. So let me give you a couple of things to think about. Okay. Did you know, and maybe you did, because I've talked about this before, did you know that there's no no jails in the Bible, there's no prisons in the Bible, and you, if you've ever read the Bible, you go, yeah, there is, there's, like, Joseph was in jail, the Apostle Paul was in prison, but those were, that was a Roman prison, or an Egyptian prison, then, and there was no Israelite prisons, okay, so I want you to think about this, there's, there's a thing called, I learned this in school, in Bible college, biblical jurisprudence, and it's, it's, it's how does God feel about things, so God says, in Genesis 9, 6, he says, if, if you murder somebody, you're to be put to death. So let me just go back. So in our system of government, like I said, we live in America, and we live under a, a constitutional republic. But in the Old Testament, the Israelites, they didn't live under a democracy or a republic or anything like that. You know what it was? It was a theocracy, which means God was in control. So God was the judge, jury, and executioner. They didn't vote for a president every four years. They didn't have a king. God was their king. That's, just, that's how they operated. So, so God, as the king, he gets to decide what the rules were, what the laws were. You can like them or this, you know, I'm against capital punishment. Okay, well, God was pro-capital punishment, at least in the Old Testament. So if you murdered somebody, um, then you were to be put, put to death. So let me, I want you to think about this for a second. Like uh, in our society... There's all kinds of somebody, if you, if you get caught shoplifting, there's a, you go to court and they go, okay, six months in jail or whatever. If you, whatever, you get drunk driving, you know, two years in jail or whatever. You know, many of you guys know my story. I went to prison when I was 22 for selling drugs to an undercover cop. They gave me a five-year sentence and uh, I wasn't in there that long. Uh, but but that's, that's how it was. And, but in, in God's economy, if we lived under a theocracy, there's no prisons. God never intended for anybody to go to jail or prison. So in the Old Testament, it was like, if you killed somebody, we killed you. 
If you raped somebody, we killed you. If you kidnapped somebody, we killed you. On and on it goes. But if, um, you know, like if, uh, like the eye for an eye. Like if you punch somebody and knock out their tooth, they knock out your tooth. If you knock out their eye, they knock out your eye. If you stole something from somebody, it wasn't capital in a cap, capital offense. There's different things in here, but God's like, God's like, if you stole something, you got to pay them, and you get caught, you pay them back four times what you stole. I mean, there was restitution involved in certain cases, or, or just killing the person, but never going to jail. Like, you never read about God saying, this person needs to go to jail for six months or six years. N- none of that was part of God's economy, okay? It just wasn't. And so, it's just interesting to think about, and so I want you to, I, I have this video, and, and then we're going to transition to something else. So, uh, I just want to show you this video about the Old Testament system of government, and then, and then we'll transition. Let's, let's look at this. The Bible records the ancient Israelite institution of cities of refuge. Incorporated into the law of Moses, these cities were to be an essential element of the Israelite justice system. They offered temporary sanctuary to people accused of murder and permanent asylum for those found guilty of manslaughter, the accidental killing of another human. In ancient Israel, the law called for anyone found guilty of murder to be executed with no other ransom deemed acceptable. Capital punishment enforced the sanctity of human life and protected the land against ritual impurity. The belief was that human blood tainted the very land in which it was spilled. If Israel was to be a holy nation with God as their leader, atonement had to be made for every intentional murder, every intentional assault against the leadership of God who had outlawed murder. There were still regulations on this capital punishment. First, someone accused of murder could gain initial sanctuary and safety by either grabbing onto the horns of an altar dedicated to God or by running to a city of refuge. The accused must then stand trial in front of an assembly of Israelites. To receive a guilty verdict, they must either admit to the crime or have two or more witnesses testify to their guilt. If found guilty, they would be executed by the avenger of blood, believed to be a close relative of the murdered person. If proven that death was accidental, the killer's safety was to be protected by the assembly who would escort them to the nearest city of refuge. If they chose to leave the city limits at any point, the avenger of blood could kill them without consequence. If the high priest died during their lifetime, the guilt of the person charged with manslaughter would be considered paid for and they would go free. The scriptures identify six cities of refuge, three on the east side of the Jordan River and three on the west side of the river. According to modern scholars, their placement meant that wherever you were in ancient Israel, you were no more than 30 miles or a full day's walk away from a city of refuge. Nevertheless, there must have arisen circumstances that necessitated a faster solution for temporary safety. And there are a few biblical examples. Adonijah, son of King David and rival to his half-brother, King Solomon, ran to the horns of the altar, and initially, he was granted clemency, later to be killed. The disgraced army commander, Joab, was also initially granted sanctuary by grabbing onto the horns of the altar. He, too, was later killed for his crimes. These instances demonstrate and clarify the quick reference to altar sanctuary found in Exodus 21, verse 14, which likely supplied Israel before the Promised Land with a way to follow the murder laws. This was, of course, before the establishment of the cities of refuge. Okay, so if you're taking notes, if you got a bulletin, I want you to write down two things. Uh, I just have two thoughts about this, and then we're going to be done. Um, only not soon. Okay. Uh, the first one is the church is supposed to be a place of refuge. So you might be thinking to yourself, how I thought we were doing the connect journey. Um, how does this all fit in? Well, I'm trying to tie it in because what I'm trying to do is we're, we're trying, I'm trying to create a, a value system that we have, a culture of grace church that we're going to be, we're always going to be a place of sanctuary like we call this auditorium like this is a sanctuary this is supposed to be a safe place it's a place where you come in and get sanctuary from the world and grace church 
needs to always be like that. I th- because churches have a tendency to lose their way. And, and if we're not careful, we can become a, a church that's judgmental about other people and not welcoming to guests. But people need to be able to come into our church and, and find rest from, from the world. And here's, here's why I bring it up. Because I'm trying to set that culture. And um, a year ago, we set out to do this stewardship campaign. It's, it's called the Connect Journey, where we're going to build a building that connects the two buildings. And to be honest with you, and I'm just going to share from my heart for a few minutes, I'm not good at raising money. I'm just not. I never have been. Um, I don't like, to be honest, it makes me feel like a used car salesman. And I'm, and, and I, and I'm not that, and I'm not trying to manipulate anybody, but sometimes it feels, it feels like that. Like, we want to build this building, and, uh, you know, and, and so I don't, I, I've talked to some people. I've got, I got some friends, lots of pastor friends, and I can't tell you how many times they've said this. Okay, here's what you do. They go, here's the, there's like tricks and strategies to raising money in the church, and they go, you need to find out, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard this, you need to f- go and find out who the top 10 givers in the church are and take them out to lunch and woo them and wine and dine them and 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 get them to give and i'm like first of all i'm never gonna do that like <laughs> that's because it just makes me it makes me feel like a televangelist getting up here and begging you for money i'm not i'm never gonna beg you for money i'm just not gonna do it i believe god laid this building on our heart and if we don't build it then we don't build it that doesn't detract for anything that we're doing as a church it just will help things go a lot smoother as a church and i believe that we're gonna do it but I'm not going to put you on a guilt trip. The Bible says, give with a cheerful, God loves a cheerful giver. So I'm not going to put, and it says, don't give in response to pressure. So I'm not going to do that. And to be honest, we don't have a lot of rich people. Um, which we're in independence. I mean, we're, we are, I know who we are. Like I am, uh, I was thinking about this, uh, my, my kids, my daughters had a track meet, um, a, a cross country meet out in Overland Park. And I'm like, if God ever called me out here, I would probably quit the ministry. Seriously, I just, I don't want to be, I don't want to be in an area like that. I'm independence to the, to the core. That's who I am. This is who I am. I don't know. I feel uncomfortable in Lee Summit and in Overland Park. Maybe you don't. And I'm not judging those people. They're nice. That, that's who they are. But this is who I am. And, um, you know, whenever I started this church 11 years ago, I, um, I started calling up churches that I'm connected with around the country and I said hey I'm, I'm starting a church will you support me and I had other my pastor friends go okay well you got to play the game you got to put on a suit and tie you got to go to their church and grovel and you got to have a King James Bible and you got to go tell them what they want to hear and I'm like screw that I ain't never doing that, that that's not who I am I'm, I'm just telling you like I'm never going to compromise who I am and if you don't like me for who I am, then you just don't like me. I don't care, you know. What I mean? And and so as a result, I didn't get a lot of money because I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like beg people for money. I had a few people go, yeah, we'll support that. We we believe in the vision of Grace Church, but I just stopped asking. I was like, if God is in this, we're just gonna do it. I don't need to beg people for money. And that's kind of how I feel about this. And I'm so, I'm glad Mary Beth's not here today. She's out of town. She would kill me if she heard me talking like this. And but I just like. I don't know. Um, so um, Ed, we, we hired Ed Holland last year. So a little over, uh, about a year ago, we started this three-year campaign. And, and he helped us do some things. Like there's an order to do things and get things in order and all that. But he goes, Joey, he goes, normally when I meet with a church and I help a church do this, he goes, there's usually two or three people that will write a check for $100,000 and someone will maybe write a check for 500000 And I was like, They'll write it, but it ain't gonna clear. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it, it ain't gonna clear at the bank. That we don't have anybody like that, and that's okay. That's all right. We are who we are. And he was he was taking a little bit of back, but he was like, I've never dealt with someone that couldn't write a check for at least fifty thousand dollars. I was like, well, okay, but uh, doesn't mean that we're not gonna accomplish the goal that God has given to us. But I'm just saying, like that, I, I'm not gonna try to finesse you like i'm not going to try to make you give all of your money and i'm not i, I just don't want to be like a used car salesman Th- does that make sense like like i feel like god wants us to do this and and i want to get up here and just go 
you should just give if God lays it on your heart. Like, give sacrificially. You know? so I do, and my family does. I promise you. I can show you our bank statement. And, and so we, we give a lot to this church because I believe in what's going on. But I'm not going to, I'm not, you, you know why? One of the things that I'm not going to do, the reason why I don't know who gives what is because I don't ever, I'm never going to treat you differently. I'm never going to treat you less than if you don't give. And I'm never going to treat you better because you do give more. There are people in our church who, I, I know there, there's a, there's a, there's, I know of one family, they're not rich by any means. But when there's a missionary, man, they give and they give and they give. And they love giving the mission. And they're great people. But I don't treat them differently because they give more than anybody else. It's just not biblical to do that. It's it, like I, I'm not going to be somebody for sale. You know what I'm saying? Like there's some churches where if, if, like if, if you're wealthy and, you, you know, in, in the old days, they're, they're, if you go to New England, I've talked about this before. I went to a church in New England in Boston, and they had, um, they had little, row, like little walls around each section. And back in the old days, they used to, you used to buy your pews. You would pay money, and you go, this is the section that my family sits in, and this is the section my family sits in. But if you were poor and you didn't have any money, you didn't get to go to that church. You didn't get to go to any church. And I'm like, that's unbiblical. You know what I mean? That couldn't be further from what God wanted for his church at all. And so if you go to New England and even around the country, you start seeing that, like I went to this one church and they said, we were the first free church in the, in the 1700s. We were a free church. I was like, what does that mean? Like, you used to have to pay to go to church. I'm like, oh my God, like, what is wrong with people? But so I'm, I'm just telling you, like our, our church, Grace Church is going to be this is just who we are, man. This is just going to be different. And, uh, and I'm never going to try to, you know, use car salesmen you uh, out of your money. And, and anyways, I'm just going to move on. That was, that was my heart, and I just wanted to share that with you. I'm not good at raising money for that reason, and I, I'm just going to tell you, hey, you should give. If you don't want to give, then don't give, and we're going to move on, okay? Um, so the, going back to this, the church, this church is supposed to be a place of, of refuge. So when you come here... It should be a place where you can get away from it all. Uh, here's my story. When I, was, when I got saved and I started going to church 27 years ago, I remember this clearly. I remember, like, I, I didn't have a background in church, so going to church was all new for me. But, but I remember pulling in the parking lot, and as soon as I got in the parking lot, I just felt this, this freeing feeling. And then I'd walk in the doors, and Otis Nixdorf was my pastor, and, and, I, and I just felt like, the work, man, all week long, the devil was on me. You ever felt like that before? You ever felt like just attack, spiritual attack? And I'm like, I'm under temp temptation. I wanted to go get high and drink at that time. And I was like, I, I, I'm just dealing with, like, my ex-girlfriend at the time was just, you know, fighting with me all the time. And I get so frustrated with everybody. And then I came to church, and I was like, oh. I'm, I'm like home, like this is freeing. And I just, for, I, I felt that, like this is not biblical, but I felt like there was like a shield around the church and the devil couldn't get in. And I was like, I was safe from the devil, you know. And one day I asked Pastor Otis, I said, Otis, can I live here at church? And he laughed. He chuckled. And I go, no, I'm serious. Like I'm not even joking around. He goes, no, Joe, you can't live here. And I was like, well, I just feel like when I'm out there, I'm attacked by the enemy all the time. The devil's after me. But when I'm here, I feel safe. And, of course, that's not, now I practically live at this church, and that's not the case. But anyways, but I do. I probably spend more time in this building than I do at my house, but um, that's, that's a different sermon. But, but I'm just, I don't know if you ever feel like that. I don't know if you ever feel the pressures of the world just on you. And if you can't come to church, if this can't be a place of refuge, what, what are we doing here? Like, what is this? This is not a social club. It's not a place for you to come to feel better about yourself. Man, it's a place to come and meet with God and go, they're the devil's trying to kill me out there. He's trying to attack me. He's trying to take everything from me. I need a place of refuge. That's what this is. That's, that's what the church is supposed to be. And so let's just move on to this next one. Number two, um, God is our only legitimate refuge. So in the, in the Old Testament, uh, can I give you guys some homework? You can take it or leave it. But go start reading through the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms, but start reading through the Psalms. And David wrote most of them, but other authors wrote some of them. But David oftentimes would come up with analogies of God. He, he would say that God is my shield, my fortress. God is my hiding place. God is my keeper. He's, 
He's my refuge. He's my rock. He's my shade, my shelter, or my strong. You know what a stronghold is? It was like, like, just imagine David, 3,000 years ago, David was a man of war. Like, like when they went to war, they didn't have drones and they weren't dropping bombs from the sky. They were like, battle here, battle here. And we got, you know, you got a sword or a spear or you got arrows. But David would go into battle with a shield and a sword. And, and so whenever he was trying to come up with something about God, he's like, God is my, my shield. Like, that made sense to him. Like, I have this shield that keeps, they're firing arrows at me, fiery arrows, and the only thing I got is this shield. And he goes, that's God. Now, if you know about David, you know that most of his, his life, his adult life, King Saul was trying to kill him, so he was on the run. And you know, this is what I love about David. David could have killed him like that. He could have snapped his neck. He could have. He had instances where he had him, where he could have just choked him to death. But he chose not to because he was the bigger person. He goes, I'm not going to touch God's anointed. So he would flee, and he was living in caves, and he was on the run, people trying to kill him all the time. And then he would sit down and write a psalm and say, God is my shield. God is my refuge. God is my, my safe place to hide. So, And I read that, and I'm like, that's me too. Let, let me just show you just a few of them. I think I got four or five of these. So this is one. The, in Psalm 144, it says, the Lord is my savior, shield, refuge, or stronghold. That's like a stronghold. Like you were out to battle and the enemy was closing in on you and you would run to this town and they had a walled city and you could get in the door. That's a stronghold where the enemy couldn't get in there. That's what God is supposed to be for you. God's like, remember at the beginning of this, I told you that God has wings and his feathers. So God's like, you're like a baby chick and I take my wings and I cover you. Go, go to the next slide. And he says, it says, the Lord is my shield and uh, my strength and my shield. Go to the next one. This is the one, uh, Psalm 91. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. I, I don't know if that speaks to you or not, but when I read stuff like this, I'm like, I need that. Like on a regular basis, man, the world is tough. Go to the next one. I think there's another one, two of them. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. And then the... This last one, I think, um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in, in trouble. And that, like, that's us. That, that's you and me, man. We're out there in the world trying to just navigate, and it feels like the boat is about to sink. But God, remember the story of Jesus in the boat with the disciples, and a storm rolled in? Remember what G the disciples were freaking out, man. They were professional fishermen. They were used to being out there. And they go, we're going to drown. And you know what Jesus was doing? He was taking a nap. He was like, this ain't no big deal to me. I'm taking a nap. So, um, so I've heard before, uh, Christopher Hitchens is a, is a famous atheist, and other people have said this, that religion is a crutch for the weak. You ever heard that before? It's kind of insulting, but religion is a crutch for the weak. But then I started thinking about it. I was like, yeah, that's true. My relationship with God is because I'm weak. I'm not strong. Are you strong? Are you strong enough to overpower Satan? Are you strong enough to get through the world's pressures without a relationship with God? I've never met anybody yet. So yeah, religion is a crutch for the weak, and I am weak. And, and so I, because I'm weak, I turn to God. And every time I turn to God for my shelter, for my safety, for my refuge, he, he like puts his wings over me and goes, I got it, Joey. You're, you're covered. Now, other people don't do that. Christopher Hitchens or whoever, whatever, a atheist, you know what they turn to? They'll tr turn to a bottle or some pills or to whatever, wh anything to make them feel better about their life or different. But that doesn't fix things, does it? They'll, they'll smoke some pot. They'll drink some alcohol. They'll do whatever. And, and at the end of the day, when they sober up, they still got the same problems they did. So when I turn to God... Like, I don't need to turn to those things anymore because I have God as my, my shelter. He's my refuge. Um, if you go, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but if you go out to uh, Susquehanna, out towards Blue Mills Road, just before you get there, there's a church on the left side. And on the sign, it says, Jesus is my Prozac. And I was like, that's wild to put that on there. You know what I mean? Like, I would never put that on our church sign. We don't have a church sign, but, um, but it's kind of kind of makes sense to me. Jesus is my Prozac. I don't, I don't need all these other things. Um, he's he's my, my fortress. Let me, let me give you a, a few analogies I was trying to come up with when I was studying for this. So I'm not going to show the video, but if you've ever seen the movie uh, Shrek, 
at the beginning when donkey, they're chasing donkey, and he like bumps into Shrek, and Shrek turns around, and he, so he protect, Shrek didn't know he was his protector, but he, he protected him, right? And that's why donkey wanted to hang out with him, because he was a big guy. Um, it reminds me of when I was, um, when I was a teenager, I was, uh, I was the same height as I am now, but I was skinny. Okay, so I was this punk, skinny punk kid, but I had a mouth on me, and I was bold. You know why I was bold? Because I had a best friend named Vinny who was about 400-pound Samoan guy. He probably wasn't that big, but uh, he was a huge Samoan guy, and I would go on Nolan Road, and I would pick a fight with somebody and go, Vinny, get him, and Vinny would <laughs> knock him out. Like, he would just beat the crap out of people, and I, and, and I was, you know, so, and I'm like, that's how God is with me now, you know? I'm out there running my mouth, picking fights with people, and God's like, I'll take care of you. Um, because God is my, my shelter. He's my fortress. Um, there, anybody remember, I think it was back in the 70s, there was a movie called My Bodyguard with, um, who is it? No, not that, not that one. This one's from the 70s, not Bodyguard, not, not with Whitney Houston. The one with Matt Damon where Matt Damon was like the bully in the school, and then this, he was picking on this kid, and the kid hires this guy to be his bodyguard. Anyways, it, that might not have been the name of it. Anyways, so, uh, okay, here's an analogy for you. I was like, God is kind of like the secret service, except he keeps us safe, you know? I don't know. Uh, he doesn't allow us. <laughs> Sorry, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. It's a sore subject. Um, okay, so those are all my analogies. Um, Hebrews chapter 6. I want to end with this. I just want to finish with Hebrews chapter 6. Because you got, just in context, okay, I'm not trying to confuse you. You got the Old Testament, you had cities of refuge. In the Old Testament, if you accidentally killed somebody, the, the person you killed, their brother or sister was coming to avenge their murder. So you fled for safety, and if you could make it to the city of refuge, you were okay. Well, now there's a spiritual application to the cities of refuge, and this is what it is in Hebrews 6, 18. It says, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable unchange because it is impossible for God to lie. Did you know that? Did you know that even if God wanted to lie, he couldn't? God couldn't, God couldn't go against his own character. It's against his nature to tell a lie. It says, therefore... We who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to this hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls, right? It's, it's an anchor. It's that idea of, of there's an anchor in the storm that Jesus is going to hold. When everything else in your life falls apart, God doesn't. It says it leads us through the... Um, Look at this part. He goes, it leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, let me just explain. So in the Old Testament, they, they didn't have a church like this. They had a tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, you would come once a year to offer sacrifices. And you would take it to the priest. You would take a, a blood sacrifice and like an animal, a spotless lamb, and the priest would slaughter that animal in the holy place, and they would, they would uh, splatter the, the blood to atone for your sacrifice, okay? So, but that was in the holy place, but back here was the most holy place, and that was where God's presence resided, like God's presence. So you weren't allowed, if you walked back there, if you were like, let me see what's behind this curtain, you're going to drop dead like that. You just would. No one was allowed back there except for the high priest could go back there one time a year to take the sacrifice for the whole nation of Israel, and he would offer a sacrifice one time a year for them, okay? And then something happened, though, because the spiritual thing is, remember, remember the cities of refuge? Remember if you were there, if the high priest died, you could now go back? So the Bible says that Jesus is our high priest and he's never going to die, right? So he's eternal. But he's our eternal high priest. And when he died on the cross, he died, he died 2,000 years ago, but he's never going to die again. But when he died, do you know what happened to that curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place? It was split right down the middle. And the Bible tells us it was so that you and I could just walk in there anytime. Before, before that happened, you walk behind that curtain, you're dropping dead. But after the resurrection or after the crucifixion of Jesus, that the, the uh, curtain was split in two, and God's like, 
you can come into my presence anytime you want. You don't have to just do it once a year and offer sacrifice. In fact, you don't have to offer blood sacrifices because the Bible says that Jesus was the blood sacrifice once for all time. So he did it one time. We never have to do that ever again. Isn't that cool? And that's what God, God is our, he's our refuge. He's our place of, of safety. And so there, there's spiritual applications here. So let's do this. Let's all bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Um, I just want to bring this to a close, and I want you to think about the, the idea of refuge. Matter of fact, everyone stand to your feet, and we're going to have a time of invitation. And um, I, I don't know, I don't know what you're facing right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I know what I go through on a daily basis, and I know how evil the world is. Like, like just, just this week, uh, just, I, I heard, you know, you know, we know that there's crazy stuff going on on the southern border and people coming across from Mexico and there's like gangs down there, right, the cartel. But this is what struck me. I heard that there's like 430 children missing. I was like, what the heck is going on? Like, there are some evil people out there. You know, when I, when I hear that, I just, it breaks my heart. I'm like, I don't, I don't care whatever you think politically. I'm just like, those poor kids. There's like almost a half a million kids just missing. Where are they? I have a pretty good idea. You know what I mean? I have a pretty good idea that something bad's happening to them. And that's tragic. And I, and I look at that and I look at all these other things. And I look at stuff in my own life and I'm like, Man, this world is evil. This is, a, this is a dark place to live in. Do you feel that? Do you ever feel alone? Do you ever feel like... Like, the, like Satan is just all over you. Like he's trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy your family. He's trying to literally kill you. If it feels like that, it's because it's true. But God is our refuge. That, that's why I love that so much. When I, that's why I love reading the Psalms. And, and I, like David, go, man, the world is just crazy. And my only source of refuge is God. So I turn to God. I run to God. And he takes his wings and he covers me. He's like, Joey, don't worry about it. I got this. You're covered. Do you feel that? Do you feel pressure from the world? Do you feel like sometimes things just don't make sense and you don't know which way's up, which way's down? And God is the only thing that makes sense to me. He's got the whole universe in his order, and he's in control, and I'm not. And I don't know what's going on most days, but I know that God is in control. So if you're dealing with something right now, the, the altar is open. Like if you want to come down here and pray, maybe something's just heavy on your heart. You want to come down and pray and um, take it before the throne, and you can do it where you're at too, but... I just, you know, when I was studying for this this week, I was just overwhelmed. I had this overwhelming sense that so many of you guys are struggling, just like me. And this, it's one of the reasons why this is church, is is a is a house of refuge. I, I've kidded around. I told the first service that if I ever changed the name of our church, we would change it to the House of Refuge, and we're not going to. We're not going to change the name of Grace Church, but. I like that idea that this is a house of refuge. It's a place where you can come and find a, a respite from, from the world. You know, there's that old adage, you're either headed into a storm or you're in the middle of a storm or you're just coming out of a storm. But make no mistake, everyone in here goes through storms of life. And the only anchor, the only shelter that we have is God. So don't turn to anything other than God. Don't turn to all these unhelpful things, these addictions. Put your faith in God. thing I want to 
just say we're just going to continue to pray but in an attitude of prayer um, I need you to understand and this is pray maybe people watching on YouTube also that all of these great promises in the Bible that are given for believers are, are not given for people who aren't believers does, does that make sense so I talk to people all the time and they're like I'm good I'm like I don't, I don't know how to get through life without God. And they'll go, well, religion's for the weak. It's a crutch for the weak. I'm good. Okay. So if you live your life apart from God, when you die, you will continue to live your life apart from God for all of eternity. That's, that's what it is. And people like to comfort themselves with this idea that God will give them a second chance after death. And to be honest with you, I really wish that was the case. But it's really not the case. With the authority of the word of God, I can tell you that there are no second chances after death. Like you have to decide what you're doing with Jesus while you're walking on earth. And that will determine where you spend eternity. And God loves you. God loves every person in this room. You were created in the image of God and he loves you. But he won't force you to become a believer. If you don't want anything to do with God, he's like, that's fine. Um, He'll be just fine. Uh, but if you're here this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and you're tired of living an isolated life from God and you want to commit your life to Jesus right now, the, because I will never scare you with the idea and the threat of hell, but heaven and hell are both realities. And I want you to think about this idea that God is our shelter. But if somebody rejects Christ, and they go into eternity, they don't have any shelter from the storm, from the eternal fires of hell. They don't have any shelter, no, no refuge. That's what hell is. Hell is the lack of refuge. It's terrible. And God doesn't want you to spend eternity in hell. He wants you to be with him for all of eternity. And I, if you're here this morning and you want to commit your life to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Right where you're at, just go. Just go, God, I, right now, I need you. I, I need to turn to you. I repent of my sins, and I turn from doing things my way. I'm going to turn to you for salvation. The best way I know how, I receive Jesus into my life, and I promise that I'm going to follow him all the days of my life. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Um, on your way out, guys, if you prayed that prayer with me for the first time, stop by the next step table in the back, and uh, we'll give you a packet to help you take your next step and um, talk with you about that. All right, everyone have a great week. See you back next week. Don't forget, next week is Commitment Sunday. So if you, uh, if you haven't yet, t- take one of these cards with you and pray about it. And if you're going to turn in the card, bring it back next week, and we'll do the puzzle pieces next Sunday. All right? Have a great week. God bless you.